Hi, and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And I'm super excited because I got a host book club this week. Ooh, tell me all about it. Well, we had to meet on a Friday because we all have very busy schedules. And unfortunately, with every, everyone else is located versus where I'm located, Friday night is very hard for me to drive in that direction. Mm. So they came to me. So it's great. I got home. I left the front door open. So I had to take a shower. <laughs> and I was like, you're probably going to get here when I'm in the shower. And they did, which is fine. <laughs> and it was great. We had frozen pizza and wine. And we got to talk about our books. And we also just have to have fun gal pal time. It's just like overall just a really nice time. And they talked about the podcast, which was great. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. Oh, see, I mean, I feel like our podcast is like that, except it's just like minus the pizza and the wine, which we need to figure out a way to do that. <laughs> yeah, right? That'd be epic. I know. It so would be. I'm so jealous that I'm not up in the same location as you to join. But I do have my book clubs down here, and they are so fun. My book clubs are at a library and a bookstore, so it's like less pizza and wine, although one of my book clubs does have snacks, and it's pretty great. (laughs) Snacks are great. I mean, you can't go wrong with snacks. Totally can't. Well, we have an action-packed episode today, so I want to get us into that. I would say we have a very book clubby episode today. We do have a book clubby episode today. And before we get into that, I, of course, have to ask you a quick question. Kelsey. Please do. So do you have a favorite trope? I was thinking about this, and I actually do think I have, maybe it's not my favorite favorite, but I probably have a hard time putting my finger on a favorite trope. I really like the enemies to friends, like enemies to lovers Mm -hmm. trope. Like I really like it, especially when the heroine's like super feisty and she's like, you can F off. Uh And the guy's just like, oh, I can't stand you, but I need you. And like, (laughs) I just love it because I feel like that just creates a whole new level of sexual tension, you know, where Mm -hmm. it's just like, I can't stand him, but I'm so attracted to him. I totally get you there. And it's funny (laughs) because like I used to think or I still think that like people who are like, oh, this is my favorite trope that can just know and just like are attracted to books of that trope. Like that was such a foreign concept to me right until we started this podcast. And then I like saw Mm -hmm. people talking about that. And I was like, huh, what do what what's my favorite trope? And I I honestly don't know if I have one just because it's like, I like them all. Like, I just like it when things are done well. Uh But I mean, definitely Enemies to Lovers is one of the better ones for me. Like, the payoff of that is like so good. It's always so good. There's just so many ways you can do it because you can have like, I like it because I think you get a lot of different dynamics within that because you can, they can be enemies because they used to be lovers and now they're enemies or they can just be like, hated each other from immediately and then now they're forced into a situation together or maybe like one of them hates that one but the other one loves that one there's just a lot of ways to play it for sure and there's one other that I know that this one can like it can easily get problematic just Mm -hmm. because of the way it is but if it's done right I feel like it can be so like heart-wrenching and like so good and that's the secret baby (laughs) I just when when there's a really good secret baby story I'm a sucker for it so it has to be like that there's a real 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 reason why you know the baby was kept secret but anyhow okay okay it can be I will say there was a oh What's that series? Oh, the True Love series. There's a secret baby in that. That was a good book, though. I I can't remember the exact one you're talking about, but I have a feeling that I I have read it. It sounds very – I mean, I read all the True Love, so I know I read it. So, yeah. Anyhow, yeah. Sorry. I, that I was like kind of like, oh, I don't know if that's my favorite one. And then I thought about that book, and I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. That so, book just brought me to my knees. I know. And it's like every trope. Wait, wait, oh, wait. It was also a, uh, it was also an enemies to lovers situation. See, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I mean it's just, I just love it when when a story takes a trope and does such a good job. And I think that our story today has done a great job with its tropes. So let's Absolutely. get on into the book that we are talking about today, which is Lord Dashwood Missed Out by Tessa Dare. Yes. So 
while it's crazy that she hasn't been on our podcast yet, as far as like books we've read, I don't know Uh. how we've not read a Tessa Dare book. (laughs) But since she is technically a new author to us, uh, (laughs) we're going to give you some author facts. So Tessa Dare is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 20 historical romances. Mixing wit, sensuality, and emotion, Tessa writes Regency set romance novels that feel relatable to modern readers. With her best-selling Spindle Cove, Castles Ever After, and Girl Meets Duke series, she has had great fun creating heroines who defy the conventions of their time, engaging in unladylike pursuits that range from paleontology to beer making, and dreaming up the strong-willed, sexy heroes who find their hearts ensnared by them. She is a librarian by training and a book lover at heart, and Tessa makes her home in Southern California, where she lives with her husband, their two children, and a trio of cosmic kitties. And I feel very lucky that I am also in Southern California, so when there are romance book signings, I often get to see Tessa there, which is very cool. Uh, Not that she knows who I am, but like I have- So close to greatness, Zoe. I know. I've met her a few times or gotten to see her speak, and I feel very, very lucky every time I do. She's fabulous. So speaking of those tropes, our main tropes today are childhood friends to lovers, only one bed. Oh no. The bridge is out. Yes. <laughs> A woman scorned. Yes. And the virgin hero. Ooh la la. <laughs> right. <laughs> and our main characters today are Eleonora Browning, known as Nora, and George Travers, Lord Dashwood. Who missed out? (laughs) He did miss out. So right as we get into the synopsis here, I do want to mention that there is a side quest that we're not going to mention here in our synopsis. It's basically the characters that are from Spindle Cove, They um, it involves getting some sherry and fighting some smugglers while while they're on their way to find and rescue Miss Browning. And as I said, we're not going to cover that here in the recap as it's not particularly important to our central love story, but we do get into it in our discussion a little bit. And it is very cute and fun, but we just wanted to kind of condense it down here for our recap. Yes. So if you are going to pick up this book after we've recapped it for you, um, you'll have a nice little surprise there. You sure will. So shall we take it away? We shall. Eleanor Browning is having a bad morning. The stagecoach she was meant to be on left early, and now she appears to be stranded at an inn, which is quite far away from her destination of Spindle Cove. Nora is an author, and she has been invited to speak on her pamphlet, and she must arrive in two days' time. But as luck would have it, although there isn't another stagecoach to Spindle Cove for the day, there is a coach about to leave heading to nearby Portsmouth, so she grabs her trunks and hops in. The coach has been bought out by a gentleman who is eager to leave, so he is her only traveling companion. Nora settles in across the bench from the man who is reading a newspaper, and when he does lower it, Nora cannot believe her bad luck, for the man is none other than Lord Dashwood. Quote, Nora had suspected it the instant she had glimpsed his silhouette. She'd known it from the way her heart raced in response. She'd always been affected by the sheer size of him. He was hewn from trunks and planks where other men were carved from branches. His broad table of shoulders, massive hands. They made her feel delicate the way no one else ever had done. Few would look at the sturdily built, fiery-haired Nora Browning and think, delicate. But she was, deep down. There were parts of her spun from floss and held together with hope, and those bits were fragile indeed. And here was the man who destroyed them. Oof. Oof. And while she futilely hopes that he doesn't recognize her, of course he does. Nora is surprised to see him back in England, but he informs her that he's been back since late October. And with pleasant trees exchanged, they lapse into silence, and Nora silently pleads... Quote, oh, Lord, please, please don't let him have heard of the pamphlet. Alas, of course he has. <laughs> How could he not have when the pamphlet is all the rage right now? The pamphlet is titled Lord Ashwood Missed Out. Eek. <laughs> mm-hmm. And as they sit uncomfortably, Nora reminisces on their history. The pair had grown up together on neighboring estates, Dash as an orphan who had come for schooling with her father. She, Dash, and her brother Andrew had been thick as thieves together, and she had harbored big hopes for a future with him. 
And after her brother Andrew's death in a riding accident, Nora and Dash had only become closer, fueling those hopes until he had stomped on them so thoroughly in her first season. Quote, Dash's treatment of her that season was so thoroughly abominable, it made Nora nostalgic for the sensation of being ignored. And a few months later, Dash had left her life completely, without even a goodbye. He accepted a job as a cartographer and sailed away, but her anger was slower to cool. And one night, she'd written her essay, quote, a literary vindication for every young woman who'd pinned her hopes to a man and then watched both man and hopes walk away. Back in the present, Nora is extremely uncomfortable, and Dash is relishing watching her squirm. He tells her that he will allow her silence if she answers one question to his satisfaction. Quote, what precisely did I miss out on? Oh, Nora, of course, <laughs> insists that the pamphlet wasn't about him. And he plays along saying, of course, Ashwood and Dashwood, completely different names. And quote, just because you penned a petty, vindictive creed about a handsome young lord of your acquaintance, a lord whose title happens to be a mere consonant different from my own, it would be absurd of me to suppose I was the inspiration. And Nora doesn't think that Dashwood should be angry. After all, has his career suffered? It has not. But she has spoiled his plans to marry, as no mothers will let their daughters near him. Nora continues to insist that the pamphlet wasn't about him, but he is done playing along. Quote, The devil it wasn't. Enough of this provocation. You don't think that I don't know, Nora, that you harbored a silly little tendry for me all those years? Of course I did. It was obvious. The insult prompts Nora to shoot back with one of her own, and she insists that since he won't listen to her actual explanation, then they can just be silent until they reach their destination. However, their fight is interrupted as the entire coach skids sideways and careens off the road. Nora is thrown, but Dash catches her before her head comes in contact with the latch. And once he's assessed that she's okay, he jumps out of the coach to take in the whole situation. He returns to say, I have bad news, and I have worse news. For the road is a sheet of ice, and the carriage's splinter bar is damaged. The team won't be able to pull the coach like this, and the bridge is out. So the driver will unhitch the team, and they can all ride back to an inn. But Nora has not been on a horse since her brother's accident, and she simply can't get back on now. With the icy road just before dark, she just can't. So why doesn't she just stay in the coach? She can take all her extra clothes out. She'll stay warm. And Dash just curses and closes the door and comes back in a bit with an alternative as he's found a nearby hut that they can hole up in for the night. Nora had thought he'd left. After all, he'd done the same before, she remarks. To which she replies, I thought your little pamphlet wasn't about me. Nora didn't reply. <laughs> Don't worry. You needn't count this as chivalry on my part, he said. I could say I'm acting out of long-held esteem for your family. But mostly, I'll be damned if I'll leave you here to scribble the sequel. Lord Ashwood left me for dead. <laughs> so the hut that he has found is small, but it has a furnace so they won't freeze. It also has only one bed. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and by the time they've reached the hut from the coach, they are wet and cold from trudging through the snow. Dash insists that Nora needs to undress as, those boots and skirts are soaked through. I'd imagine your stockings are as well. I can imagine it now. Lord Ashwood gave me the og. <laughs> <laughs> and when he tries to help her, their hands meet, and Nora realizes that his own hands or ice. And her demeanor changes immediately. The tension between the two of them is quite high. Mm -hmm. But they part and work together for a while to get a fire started and share sips from his flask to warm their insides too. Then the awkward silence really sets in. But of course, this can't last. He taps annoyingly. She sharpens her quills loudly and annoyingly. He threatens to write his own pamphlet called Lord Ashwood Has No Regrets and change her name by one letter to Miss Frowning. In fact, <laughs> he may also sue Nora for libel as, quote, the entire thesis of your pamphlet is faulty. Nora can't help but bite how so, she asks. And he replies with a devastating remark. I took the opportunity to expand my knowledge, use my talents, and explore the world. And yet you say I missed out because I didn't stay within five miles of my birthplace and settle down with the girl next door? He held out his hands, palm up, like a pair of scales with his options weighed on either side. He lifted one hand. World of adventure. He lifted the other. You. 
Oh my God. (laughs) That's mean. Yeah, I know it is. That's mean. Oh, that's a good one. Of course, Nora is appalled because she had put her everything into that pamphlet and it had been her most courageous act to publish it. And she had gained respect from it, from women all over England. So she refuses to stand for his censure because she's worked so hard for her success. But he insists that he would have every justification for exacting his revenge. Unless Nora could prove it, quote, demonstrate to my satisfaction that I missed out on something, anything. We're here and we do have all night. Ooh, throw down that gauntlet. And Nora had thought of this opportunity for too long. So she begins. To start, he could have had an intellectual partner in her, not just some brainless beauty. He shoots back that as a champion of the female sex, shouldn't she say that brains and beauty can come in one package? After all, she is an example of that as well. And of course, Nora is a bit disarmed when Dash calls her beautiful. She's never felt particularly so, as she doesn't fit the delicate standard currently in fashion. She is flustered and insists that he could never notice her that way. Oh... But of course he had. (laughs) And he had often had to make excuses not to get up from their lessons because he was in a state because of her. And he continues, quote, Suffice it to say, beauty and intelligence are not so hard to come by in one person. And it's been many years since I noted both qualities in you. So again, I ask, how can you justify this scurrilous pamphlet? What did I miss out on? Nora wants to shout that he missed out on her heart, but she can't bring herself to. And memories bubble back to the surface. She's transported back to their school time. Dash was left-handed, so he always sat on the left, with Andrew in the middle and her on the right. And then Andrew's accident had happened. And when they had eventually resumed lessons, they sat closer, their dominant hands writing on the outside, which left their non-dominant hands free. And that first day, Dash had reached for her hand under the table, clasped it firmly, quote, And that moment... Infatuation had become love. They worked that way for hours. Fingers twined beneath the table in secret whilst they continued writing with their favorite hands. And for every minute that ticked away on the clock, Nora's heart was another mile gone. Oh my God, that scene. (laughs) I know, that's so beautiful. And after reminiscing about this moment, Nora almost tells the truth. But she isn't quite ready yet, so she settles on something that feels safer, saying that he missed out on, quote, only the greatest pleasure of your life. We would have been magnificent lovers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many lovers he's had, Nora insists that she has more passion in one fingertip than they would have had in their whole bodies. And somehow, this conversation opens up the way for an actual honest one. He admits that of course he had wanted to seduce her, but good breeding kept him from doing so. She asks why he had treated her so terribly his first season, and he admits that he was callow and immature, but so was she at the time. They were too young. But Nora continues that she used to daydream about the day he came to tell her father he was leaving. If she had come down, she could have made him change his mind. But Dash replies, Nora. He exhaled her name as a weary sigh. You could not have made me stay. You can't know that. He was silent for a long moment. Very well, then. Have your chance now. And so they pantomime it. Dash leaves out the door of the hut. Nora races after him, shoeless in the snow, shouting his name. When he turned and they met, she grabs him for a passionate, all-consuming kiss, whispering, stay to him. And when she pulls back, breathing, well? Sweet, darling Nora, he caressed her face. I still would have left. (laughs) Dash had been tempted to marry her for his lust for her and as he loved her family, but insists it wouldn't have been fair to marry her for those reasons. Quote, Would we have been content? I suppose so. Perhaps even happy. But we would have never pushed our boundaries, become our best and bravest selves. I would not be a cartographer. You would not be a writer. God, look at you. You're famous. Wanted for speaking engagements all over Britain. It's remarkable. You're remarkable. Nora insists, though, that the problem has always been her heart and is about to declare something very important when the pair of them hear an ominous slam. The door to the hut has slammed shut in the wind, and, uh uh-oh, thunk, it appears that the bar has also fallen into place. Now the two are locked outside in the complete freezing darkness in hardly any clothes. Remember that. In fact, Nora is shoeless. Fuck! (laughs) 
she says. <laughs> the word hung in the air, sharp and clear as icicles. Dash laughed, and suddenly the despair felt a little less. A lady shouldn't know that word. A lady shouldn't use that word, she corrected. And I'll admit, I have never used it before. But what have I been saving it for, if not this moment? Fair enough, he nodded in grim agreement. Fuck. <laughs> so the conversation is abandoned as they scurry to find a way back in. It takes some doing, but eventually Nora is boosted and wriggled through a tiny high window that they manage to pry open using the boning from her corset and then falls to the ground in a breathless heap that leaves Dash extremely worried. When she finally lets him in, he's quite tender and concerned, and the rush of the danger and the cold and now the warmth and safety leads to more intimate conversation. Quote, now then, he said, let's go back to the subject we were discussing in the snow, right after that magnificent kiss and before the slamming door interrupted us. You'll have to remind me, she whispered. What subject was that? You were about to tell me you loved me. And Nora tries to backpedal, but Dash pleads. He wants to hear it, even if it's not true now, because no one has ever said it to him that he can remember. And how can you argue with that? Ugh. And so Nora relents and admits that she had loved him with, quote, imprudent, reckless abandon. But she goes on because she feels that he must know that she wrote the pamphlet not about him, but about herself, how heartbroken she was and disappointed in herself. She had to find a new purpose. And truthfully, Dash is so proud of her and her accomplishments. And now that the truths are out in the open, this leads to encounter number one. Nora wants to make it magnificent, but Dash insists that it's not going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean it can't be good. However, their honest chatter relaxes them, and they have a pretty wonderful time together. And afterwards, he says, quote, I can declare, without a doubt, best lovemaking ever. She grinned with satisfaction. Magnificence accomplished. Of course, he said, staring at a lock of hair as it wound around his finger. It was also my first lovemaking ever. Um, what? <laughs> Surprise! Uh, Nora, just like most readers, is in disbelief. But Dash explains a bit, and Nora also reads between the lines. He actually has really good reasons for not having had sex yet. He was an orphan, and he didn't want to risk disease and death. He hadn't wanted to risk fathering a bastard or angering a jealous lover. And, oh, he also hadn't wanted to risk opening his heart to someone that he couldn't trust. And with that, they continue their very good night. The next morning, Nora wakes in a wonderful mood. She begins making ready to leave, but Dash is confused. The bridge is out, remember? She can't get to Spindle Cove. And come on, they'll be fine without her. They'll understand about the storm. But she insists that she must be ready to depart and goes to the coach to grab a few of her things. Still naked, Dash can't run behind her until clothed. But at the coach, Nora runs into her own rescue party in the form of the Spindle Cove husbands, who have been sent to look for her. She is elated at the rescue, but then extremely, extremely upset to discover that the bridge isn't out. And they note that the carriage actually seems to be in perfect form. So this all adds up to the fact that Dash must have lied to her. Dash himself comes out of the hut dressed and pleading to explain, but Nora is furious. She allows Griffin to pull her up onto his horse, and the crew ride away to Spindle Clove, thinking Lord Dashwood had missed out. That evening, Nora is finishing her talk on her pamphlet, and it's been a great success. Now, are there any questions? Of course there are. In fact, there's a very important one from the gentleman in the back, and it's Dash. And after he introduces himself to the crowd, who titters in excitement. He <laughs> insists that he must speak with her. Quote, why? So you can tell me more falsehoods? No, I, you lied to me, she bit out, about the road, the coach, the bridge, everything. She skewered him with a glare. I'll bet you weren't even a virgin. The bustling of the crowd abruptly ceased. One could have heard a snowflake twirl to the floor. Lord Payne tossed back a swallow of sherry. I really must attend these things more often. <laughs> it was so hard to say that without laughing. It's so funny. <laughs> it is funny. And Dash admits he lied about the coach and the bridge, but not about everything. He is very sorry about the deceit, but he had been desperate for time alone with Nora and felt she'd never granted to him. He needed to know if he had any chance. Any chance of what? 
I convince you to marry me. Now every woman in the library gasped in shock. And while this is oh so romantic, they've been through a lot in the last day and their lifetime, and so Nora needs more. So Dash asks for a copy of Sir Bertram Coddington's World Atlas to prove it to her. And there she sees that he's named something for her on every page. Nora Pond, Mount Browning, Eleanora Point. He has named all the fictitious places that they put in their atlas to protect against copying after her as, no matter where he went, she was missing. Oh, plus he wants her to come on voyages with him. In fact, imagine the memoir she could write. Lord Ashwood's ship has sailed. (laughs) Dash had, in fact, realized that he'd missed out. And while it had taken him some time to get back to her, here he was. And he does love her. And so Nora kisses him and declares that Lord Dashwood has met his match. Aww, so fun. So cute. <laughs> I love it. I love the little nothings. Ah, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that. However, first, I think we have to adjourn to the parlor. Shall we? We shall. <laughs> This week's book recommendation comes from Twitter. We had a lovely thread with lots of responses because we asked about romances that feature non-abled-bodied or disabled main characters. So we're going to be sharing a few of them in the coming weeks, and we're also going to have an accompanying blog article with all of them on our website soon. So today's recommendation comes from user Cats Babs, who recommended My Darling Duke by Stacey Reed. And this is a pretty new release. It came out in December 2019. And the synopsis reads like a Beauty and the Beast adaptation, but it features a hero who became wheelchair bound after a tragic accident. And it looks really good to me. And so I'm really interested in checking this one out. And so many great things were were recommended, and I'm really excited. There's a lot of really cool stuff, and I'm just excited to share them with you all. So thank you to Cats Babs and all of the others who answered. And again, if you want to see them sooner, you can check us out on Twitter at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets, or soon we will also have a blog post on our website about it. And if you have another book recommendation... We would love to hear from you. If you have an inclusive author you love, we want to hear about it and share it. Let us know through our email, romancepod at gmail.com. And if you'd like to find us elsewhere on social media, you can find us on Instagram at T as in Tom and as in Nancy Strumpets, Facebook slash T and Strumpets, Pinterest the same, and YouTube by searching our name. And if you really want to be in the know, sign up for email notifications on our website. Our email is romancepod.com, and there you can find episodes, more information about us, and other resources. So take a look. And now we are so excited to get into our general thoughts about Lord Dashwood Missed Out, and we are joined by a very special guest. So we really hope you guys enjoy it. We thought it was fabulous, and we hope you do too. So today we have a very special guest joining us. It is a friend of ours that we met through Bookstagram, and her name is Maisie. And Maisie Eddings is a neurodiverse writer, tooth mechanic, and stage mom to her cats, Yaya and Zadie. She can most often be found reading romance novels under her weighted blanket and asking her boyfriend to bring her snacks. Her debut, Own Voices Rom-Com, is repped by Kelly Martin at Wendy Sherman Associates, and we are so excited to have her on with us today. So Maisie, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Yeah. And I just, when we, when we talked about this book, I was like, that would kind of be a perfect (laughs) one to invite (laughs) Maisie on because you kind of have this, this reputation that you have written for yourself, shall we say, (laughs) uh, through one particular article that you wrote for Frolic, which was like, I, I, I might, quote the title wrong, but it might be an ode to virgin heroes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I was like, ah, oh, this would be a perfect one. We should totally have her come on because, you know, that's, I mean, it's your thing now. Are you embracing it's it? It's my way to 
<laughs> I actually got a message on um, Inst- on my bookstagram and it was like, hey, are you that reviewer that talks about depression and virgin heroes a lot? And I was like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> who I am. Hey, at least you have a thing. That's all good. Yeah, yeah I'm very on Yeah, brand. it's very important to have a brand nowadays. So I think that you've, you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's very proud. <laughs> I, I imagine, I imagine. But I just, I thought this would be a perfect one. So I'm so glad that you decided to join us. So let's get into our our book recap here. And so like we usually start off with just our our general thoughts and we won't make you go first, Maisie. So, <laughs> um, so general thoughts, Kelsey, you want to take us away on your general thoughts of Lord Dashwood missed out? I would love to take you away. So I thought it was quite cute. Like, I just really, I got warm, fuzzy feelings through the whole thing, which to be fair is expected of a Tessa Dare. <laughs> and especially since it's been so long since I've read the Spindle Cove series, but I have such fond memories of the Spindle Cove series and to bring the heroes from like the other books in and make them such like an integral part of this one. I was just like, oh, yay! I love all these guys. <laughs> so in that respect, I thought it was really fun. And You know, I'm not always, like, a big fan of the underhanded, like, I lied to you to get Mm -hmm. you alone so that way we could talk. And I'm like, eh. Mm. But overall, I thought it was just clever and cute, and I liked it. (laughs) (laughs) Maisie, how about you? I – I loved it. Um, I mean, I – okay. I do also have a lot of hang-ups about, like, the lying Mm -hmm. trope sort of thing. But I mean, I also did think it was clever how she navigated that and like worked that in there and all of that stuff. I liked how strong of a heroine Nora was. And I thought she was like really multidimensional, which I appreciated. And then of course, just like having the Lords of Perdition and like being <laughs> Colin. I love Colin so much. So like- It's hard you know, not to love Colin. I mean, he is just so iconic. It's hard. It's hard to top him. And so like anything that has Colin making a cameo is just automatically like top of the list for me. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. So you guys both mentioned like really loving the little snippets of the Spindle Cove boys. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I could have, I could have done without. <laughs> like I, uh, that was the part to me where I like I kind of skimmed because I was like, I this is mm-hmm. just this is not important to the story. But I like mm-hmm. I also completely understand that like it gave the story a little bit more like otherwise why is this even in the spindle cove series like why mm-hmm. is she even mm-hmm. coming to spindle cove like that wouldn't have needed to happen so it wasn't like a bad choice it just didn't do anything for me but that also might be because i don't love 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 the spindle cove series like mm. a lot of you know i don't know it's just it's one of those that to me is like I can take it or leave it. The the most I don't have a favorite book from it. Well, this probably is my favorite <gasps> book from it. I know. I know you guys are looking at me like oh I'm the worst. This is like fighting words, Zoe. I, just, I mean, I knew your feelings on Spindle Cove, Zoe, <laughs> before this, when you're like, mm, I have mixed feelings about Spindle Cove, and I was like, Okay. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm not I'm not speaking to the right people about this. But so that's why to me, like the the Spindle Cove boys, like it just kind of like felt mm-hmm. superfluous to the really fun like little love story that was happening but i really liked the book i thought for a novella it is really a cool one because it's short mm-hmm. it's really short it's not one of those novellas that's like almost like almost a novel or it takes you mm-hmm. a little longer mm-hmm. to read than you expected it's like really great. It's so it's such a fast, happy little, you know, candy read that you can just like you can go to that and it's like really comforting because you're like I only maybe have a couple of hours, like I'm just going to read this and and be done with it. And so like for me like and you can read it in a couple hours, which I is think impressive. That, yeah. I think I read it in an hour and a half. Like because I mean I I, I skimmed the the parts about the guys. I was like and I I've, I've read it fairly recently because actually Maisie, I think when you posted about it most recently because you posted about it on Instagram and you were like, this had a surprise virgin hero. And I was like, have I not read this? And I went back and reread it. And I was like, no, 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 I have read this. This is great. You know? (laughs) So, so I had read it like fairly recently. So it was, it was more of like a refresher than a, like, I need to sit down and like really, um, you know, get into it. But yeah, I liked, um, I liked the characters. I also didn't, I got a little like, 
skeezy when he was like, oh, well, he kind of lied to her the whole time, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, Tessa Dare does that thing where she just like, you can't be mad at her. Like she just kind of yeah. does it so yeah. well that you're like, well, all right. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm along for the ride and, and it's redeemable. Like there's nothing mm-hmm. about it that's not like when he's a little puppy dog in the in the book signing. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, it's so cute. She does do such a good job of like redeeming all of her heroes because they ca- they can get so bad and yet like her books still have such a lightness about them mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. just feel like you always end up feeling good and you're always like oh th- they found their way like I can forgive them yeah and yes. and Nora wasn't perfect either I mean mm-hmm. she wrote a no. very blatant kind of. <laughs> slanderous thing (laughs) about this guy and i mean power to like girl power you know go for it girl but at the same time like okay like his points are fairly legitimate yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i i do enjoy the fact though that like he had the wherewithal to to like recognize that they both needed to have like very separate journeys in order to grow like individually and then come together and i love when like, you know, we have couples that come together in that way. It just feels really, like, yeah. fulfilling. And I did I did like that line. You know, there was a part where she's – where he was just, like – she's, like, would you have left if I'd stopped you? And he was, like, yes, I still would have left. Like, mm-hmm. even knowing what I know now, I still would have left because that's what I had to do. Like, yeah. that was for me to become who I am. Mm-hmm. And I had to figure out, like, my own life and my own person to be worthy of you, you know, essentially. Or to just be ready for marriage, you know? Like, I mean, I think, like... So young. It's I think he was 25 in this Mm. one. Like, um, Yeah, they're both, like, they're both 23 and 25, and he left when she was, like, 18 and he was 20. So it's been, like, yeah, babies, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yeah. And, And plus he was an orphan and he had no family and, like... I think he there was like that he needed to find that sense of self before he could like find himself mm-hmm. with somebody else too, which was important. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit deeper about our hero and heroine. So we've got uh Lord Dashwood, George Travers, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, what do you guys think about him? I had, you know, I think I had mixed opinions on him at first. Like You know, because he came in and she recognized him and it was like, oh, like, what did I miss out on? She's like, oh, God, he's so mad at me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be here. And I guess at the end, why his lying, I guess, was okay was because in the sense that, like, he needed them to have a moment to actually talk. And this is how he figured, like, the best way. Because if he just approached her on the street or at her house, like, she probably would have been like, Ah, he hates me, you know? I guess. <laughs> and they wouldn't have been able to talk. And so I guess it could be excused. So I didn't I didn't like the deceit, but I guess in some ways, like, the deceit was good because it was all about trying to get her in a place where he could, like, they could truly talk and have a conversation. Like, yeah. so it was, like, good-natured deceit. <laughs> Is that a uh, thing? Well-intended, well-intended mm-hmm. yeah, deceit. there you yeah. go. Well intended to see. So eh. I I mean, what I appreciated is like how imperfect of a hero he was, actually, because like mm-hmm. I feel like I've been reading a lot of books lately where the heroes have been just like so perfect and there's like little room for reformation or, or you know, even that much growth because like just from the start they're like these swoony perfect heroes. And mm-hmm. I kind of like the fact that like he was pissed off at her and like he was like straight up confronting her like you wrote like you did me dirty and you wrote like this really mean pamphlet and like you know it's messed with my chances and stuff I think like he was just really dynamic which I thought was like super intriguing for a character and like I do think like his the reason for his lying was it was so over the top and extra to go to those lengths but it also was just like (laughs) she like Nora's over the top and extra too like she wrote she wrote like this whole pamphlet about him leaving and then it sold like thousands of copies like she's a dramatic girl and now she makes a living touring yeah yeah 
being like talking about him yeah. by like by my pamphlet yeah. about this guy who left me. Yeah. <laughs> so she's super dramatic. So he just like was like, you know what? I'm gonna be super dramatic, and I'm like gonna just he he went for it. He shot his shot, and he was like, so in that sense, I was okay with it. I mean, I'm never super comfortable with like the lying aspect of it. And the one thing that got me is like she, <laughs> you know, like they could have died in this snowstorm and that's what i was like really like oh, your yeah. thought is like hmm let me just like see how far i can go with this and like risk hypothermia to really just even the playing field between the two of them but like that great scene where yeah. like she runs out <laughs> yes. oh, so in her case and then like the door shuts yeah. behind him and he's like oh god we're gonna die yeah. out here all because like had to we had to make a point because yeah. they're and, both so dramatic like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I completely agree. I feel like I I like him as a hero. Like you said he kind of has these this like he has quite an arc within like very mm-hmm. few pages, right? You know, he yeah. starts off and you think like he's going to just be an ass, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And then you figure out who he is and you're like, "Oh god, this is this is awkward." <laughs> and then like, you know, there's only one bed, so oh. <laughs> so oh no you kind of see where it's going but and and yeah the lying and the deceit like the th- the thing is the reason it's there is because it makes a great mm-hmm. story like it just mm-hmm. makes yeah. a really fun story mm-hmm. and you kind of i mm-hmm. and like i know we all want to be like eh, about it but at the same time i think we all are like eh, because yeah. it, it's like <laughs> it was so good like yeah. it's so fun and if you just mm-hmm. kind of say like it was fun and, you know, at the end they kind of both got to their points and I think everything both of you said is completely spot on. Like, you know, like he, she was a little extra, he was a little extra, they're young, mm-hmm. like, but none of those things even really matter. Like, that's us, like, really yeah. analyzing it, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. just like, well, but it was, it was really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah. I think the, the only place where I get a little, like, miffed at him, like, actually is, like, you didn't plan it good. No. Like, you didn't no. plan it good. Like, you yeah. didn't have any food in the hut. Like, you didn't have yeah. any food in the carriage. You like, you could have, any- you could have, like, packed some food with you. Like, some sandwiches. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, something. Like, I don't know why that was not thought of. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's where I was like, yeah, some sandwiches, maybe some Tinder. Like, you know, you're going to be stuck there all night. So like, what? And, and it was weird, though, that like the, the carriage did seem to tilt. So they did actually have like a, mm-hmm. a skidding incident. But I think almost I think the whole like axle breaking thing, I think that was just like an ad lib on his mm-hmm. part. I think it was like the bridge I think he was going to be off out. the first one. Yeah. I think he paid this, and then he like talked to the driver, and the driver was like, "Oh no, I can get you back on the road." Mm-hmm. And he's like, "But I see a hut yeah. there. You could probably he, get into that." I thought he planned the whole night. Maybe he didn't. That that see that's another. No, I think it was an ad lib when he went too. out to like see what was wrong, and he like talked to the driver, and then he came back. He's like, "Oh yeah, okay, so that was less deceit. Got it. That's less deceit because that to me is like." He just was like, let's get her in the carriage with me Mm -hmm. to talk. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Like, he's still getting her to her destination. No, I think the whole, like, let's get her in the carriage, we can talk. And then when it just so happened that, like, I think he was thinking the ride was going to be too short. Yeah. (laughs) I think he thought the ride was being too short and they hadn't gotten to enough conversation. He's like, I need to postpone this journey a little bit longer. So, like, there's a safe space we can, like, stay for the night. Like, he'll come back in the morning and all will be well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I also think, to, yeah, I got the same vibe that that was ad-libbed. And, like, I, and I kind of liked that he, like, hired off the carriage and stuff because he was, like, kind of that desperate to see her. And I just, yeah, I completely agree that he was just, like, okay, I can really use this situation to my advantage. Like, we might die, but that's okay <laughs> because, like, yeah. it's all in the name of love, you know? Yeah. So let's talk about, like, his – probably defining characteristic right (laughs) which is the fact that he is a virgin um yeah that was uh unexpected for sure very unexpected great reveal no hints at it like when i read that the first time my jaw was on the ground like i was giddy with excitement at a surprise virgin (laughs) hero (laughs) i had no idea but i loved that like that was amazing yeah, there's to me their scene together was like 
it was really perfect mm-hmm. in in a lot of ways because you know she's she's like oh I'm gonna make this like the best night of your life and he's like yeah sure yeah you are <laughs> and um and and then you know they they kind of get into that moment and and he really says all the right things and everything you know about how mm-hmm. like you know it's not going to be perfect but mm-hmm. it's going to be it's going to be what it is and they're going to have a great time together and they're with each other and and all these things and also i really felt like he had such a strong reason for being a virgin mm-hmm. like he really I did agreed. it wasn't really like did. this uh, oh my mm-hmm. god he's a virgin you know yeah. like how how could he have done that like the moment that you th- like thought about the character for two seconds and Tessa Dare explains it, mm-hmm. you know, he's an orphan. He, you know, he's never had a family. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to let someone in close. He's afraid of dying, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all of those things make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so well thought out too on her part. Like it, and, but then the foreshadowing or like the hints she did at the beginning where she made him seem like a total rake too. Like it was so well done. Yeah. And I think that just added to the shock factor and like mm-hmm. it was just like chef's kiss like I, was <laughs> so- I i really do love the virgin heroes who like have a history or a reputation as a rape mm-hmm. and it's like i can't remember who wrote it did we read it or did i read it at a different time but it's like literally like everybody thought he was the biggest rake because all the rumors were spread about him and then like finally like he's with you know the heroine and he's like she's like you have this reputation he's like yeah so i didn't sleep with this one lady and then so she just lied to her friends about it and so then like it just perpetuated and perpetuated so like all these women were like oh my god i had him in bed and they're like oh well i had him in bed you know and he was so magnificent and he literally like hadn't even kissed any of them you know like he was a i can't remember this book but it was like a total me you have to (laughs) i'll have to figure out which book it is because i just i remember reading it i was like oh this is so funny Uh, because like it was a total thing like reputation as a rake seen as a rake totally virgin hero (laughs) Oh my gosh. Oh my God. What is it about the Virgin Hero? What is the thing that makes the Virgin Hero like so interesting and and fun to read? Okay. Do you mind if I yep. go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's for so you. <laughs> I think I think that it's like it's actually a really deep meaning behind it because we're raised in this society where we believe that like Men are supposed to have all of these notches in their bedposts and like there is a certain amount of societal worth placed on men with sexual experience and then women are still like kind of held in this not even kind of they're held in this idea that they need to be pure and they need to be you know demure and come to relationships with little to no experience to make them worthy and so it like completely flips that on its head and like Also, in light of all of the things that happen in today's society, like the Me Too movement and just like the constant like stories about people being sexually harassed or like, you know, rape culture in general, it kind of reestablishes this belief that like men can be gentle and men can be like have like self-restraint because, you know, we're constantly told that like promiscuous sexual behavior and things like that is just boys being boys and so like seeing somebody that is willing to wait for the right person or doesn't want to just jump into bed with every like willing lady like allows us to reevaluate some of like just the trauma that we have women have faced for so many years around like gender and sexuality yeah (laughs) i mean yes no and and when you say like that you know even today you know we're still held to this pure standard like it it's so true i mean Mm -hmm. and and in different parts of the country and different cultures in the u.s at at the very least Mm -hmm. um i can say absolutely i mean i was watching last week the bachelor Mm -hmm. and one Mm -hmm. of the they were at they were on hometown visits and you know the bachelor is meeting the father of one of his prospective brides and the dad said to him She's just so pure. And I was just like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it was like, I had just this moment where I was like, oh, like life, come on. Yeah, it's 2020. No. no, you poor thing. First of all, she's 23. She should not be on this. She should not be getting married oh. to this man. But, but like, the, just, there. I mean, that's a whole other podcast. I don't need to get into it. But it is absolutely a thing that is still ingrained in mm-hmm. so much of society. And I think that's why, mm-hmm. like, you know, more and more of us need to say, like, no, mm-hmm. that's 
this is a double standard. Mm -hmm. And also, this is 2020. And so there's a lot of, of things that, you know, go along with that. And I just, yeah, I'm I'm in agreement. Yeah. And I agree, too, with the idea that um, this idea that boys are supposed to be boys and they're supposed to have all these notches in their bedpost. Mm -hmm. And it and like they're not supposed to wait versus like women mm -hmm. are. But at the same time, too, I just think that's such a it just brings in a different depth of character because mm -hmm. you need to be like. You know, and because especially if it's a virgin hero who's not like shy mm -hmm. or not like, Maybe. I guess, like apologetic <laughs> yeah. because he's a virgin, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm a virgin. Women don't apologize okay. when they're a virgin. They're like, I'm a virgin. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, saving myself just, like, for marriage. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Actually no. Another, and then it, that's yeah. what another but one to, of like, the Bachelor contestants oh. said. She, we, oh. we, that was a second one, a different one. Guys. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Everybody's like, like, no, like, but and, okay. <laughs> I, but I, I should, I should say, it is a personal choice, and if that's the choice that it you is. want to make, similarly to how we actually all lauded the choice that our hero made in this, like mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. that is absolutely a valid choice. I just hate seeing it be so rooted in religious undertones rather than it. And, and 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 feeling like it's a forced upon thing based on constraints that are are not just a personal opinion. But I, I just want to say, if there are listeners out there who feel that way, I really don't mean to be mm -hmm. like, you know, like yeah. saying bad things about your personal choices because that's a very personal choice. I just think anything sexual is a personal mm -hmm. choice. Whether you want to have no sex, lots of sex, like whatever you want to do, mm -hmm. whoever you want to do that with, that's your mm -hmm. choice. And honestly, as long as you're all free and consenting adults. Mm -hmm. Do your thing. And I think it's like, I think the issue is the worth that's played, like, that's generated. And like, people place more worth on that choice where it's just like, it, it, everybody's worth should be equivalent whether they choose to wait until marriage or whether they choose to lose their virginity, mm -hmm. you know, as an, a, con a consenting adult. Like, it's, it's placing value on this just like social construct of purity. And that's where the problem is. Like, yeah. Cause again, like you said, it just comes down to like, it's your personal choice. And I, and I think with all of this too, it like, it even correlates over to romance novels and like why it makes the public so uncomfortable because it's like, it's women making this choice to read about other women's like sexuality and sexual autonomy and things like that. And so it's like, it, it makes other people uncomfortable when it doesn't, when we're not like falling in line with this ideal version of like a non-sexual woman, you know, mm -hmm. that, that waits mm -hmm. to find any sexuality until she's in like a marital bed. Yeah. Well, and I was thinking about the Virgin Hero also, because I can think of off the top of my head, four books that I know have a virgin hero. Mm -hmm. And there are many more, but those are just the ones that came to mind right now. Three of those books have a religious figure and a promiscuous woman. Mm. Mm -hmm. So those those three books are A Notorious Countess Confesses. That's Adam Sylvain, the vicar. And we've got the mm -hmm. countess that used to be a, a courtesan. And then mm -hmm. we've got, uh, I think it's Unclaimed mm -hmm. by Courtney Milan. Um, also, same situation. We have a guy writing about purity. I don't know if he's a religious figure, but he's like writing about chastity. He's known for yeah. that. And then we have a woman who I believe was also a courtesan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I haven't read it yet, but The Lord I Left by mm -hmm. Scarlett Peckham, which is yes. you know, Hever Henry Eversham, Eve Sham, mm -hmm. and uh, a courtesan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I kind of wonder is this is different, right? This is mm -hmm. two virgins. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like usually like reading or thinking about sex between two virgins, you're kind of like, oh, like nobody knows what they're doing. It's bumbling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it still like Tessa wrote a great scene and it was very sweet and it didn't feel like it didn't feel un it didn't feel impossible, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it felt mm -hmm. like a scene no. of two people really, you know, meeting and exploring each other for the first time and it was great. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if like the courtesan and the virgin hero is like the way that we can get into that easier in historical romance. I mean, I like those stories, mm -hmm. but I'm just like, what is it about that, that that kind of feels like the story that has to be told? Well, I would actually, I mean, I do think, I read an interesting article about that too, where it, it's like the the taboo nature of like, 
it, well, I, I don't know. I use taboo loosely here, but like a religious figure with somebody that's like a courtesan or, you know, has more experience with their sexuality. But um, I feel like a lot that I've actually read and enjoyed didn't necessarily have that religious element. The the Highwayman or Highwayman by um, – I forgot that's a virgin hero. Yeah, and they're because, both I virgins. Mean, well, he'd been raped. Yeah, but so I mean, like, but I, I, but yeah, it was his first like consensual sexual experience. Yeah, and I think like yeah, and, and that one was that one was so heavy. But I thought that's what made it extra beautiful. It was like the first time that he he was taking like autonomy yeah. of of his body and his sexuality and everything. Um, yeah, and like that's, that's true. what to me made it like that's his first time and that's the time that matters because it was the time like he was empowered and and that was like a really moving I thought you know perspective on that too and then the other one that I think about is Outlander have you guys read Outlander uh, I haven't read it, but I did watch the first season of it, so I know exactly what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Outlander, it kind of it, – it's that gray area between, like, romance or just historical fiction. But um, in that one, you know, you do have, like I, – I, I guess it does have, like, some religious elements just because Jamie, the hero, you know, is – he he's Scottish and Catholic, I think, think or something like – well, he he's a mm-hmm. religious person, but he just, like – he just had made the choice to wait until marriage, and then he had a slight mm-hmm. uh, heroine. Claire was slightly older, and she ha- had been previously married, so she had experience. And like, I think what makes it really unique, like in any of these situations, though, where you're you're dealing with with the virgins, <laughs> the male virgins, mm-hmm. is like how it always like comes back to like they're finding themselves with this other person like I feel like a lot of times the characters and like the virgin heroes already have a sense of self and so it's like they're handing over a piece of themselves to the heroine in like this you know like sexual bond and like connection and stuff and maybe Mm -hmm. I'm like way overthinking it too (laughs) well that's what we're here for (laughs) yeah no but that's that's just kind of the whole point of like a romance novel in general is the idea of like you're getting an intimacy and like the the romance and the sex is meant to be a realistic portrayal of a relationship and the intimacies within that relationship. So like to have someone be a virgin and someone, you know, not or to have two virgins, that's a level of intimacy that only those two will ever share. Mm-hmm. And that's like a huge dynamic part of that relationship. Yeah, I I, th- I mean, c- kind of to answer my own question, like, I think that the reason that in historical romance, we see a little bit more of that is because I think that two virgins is is harder to do, mm-hmm. and often not as fun. Like, there's <laughs> less, there's less to play with. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. just less to play with. That's true. And so when you have one character who has more experience than the other, it, you just you have a lot more, a lot more to use. Mm-hmm. And so I imagine like, okay, but in historical romance, like we are kind of constrained to two things if for a woman, a widow or a mm-hmm. courtesan, you know, mm-hmm. or Sorry, the Ray Kess. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> um, great book, guys. I still can't. I'm still, I'm still like floating after reading it. I really love that book. But in general, like they, so there isn't that mu- as much mm-hmm. for a woman, you know, for the men, it's kind of known. And so like, because we get so many virginal characters in historical romance, just because that's how the time was, mm-hmm. we often have these men who have these sexual experiences. Mm-hmm. And so that gives you tons to play with. And, and so I see like wanting to flip it. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's, I, I like it. I mean, like, I love A Notorious Countess Confesses. I love Unclaimed by Courtney Milan. Like those are great. They're great books. Mm-hmm. I just think it's interesting, like, you know, how, how you get there and, and, and kind of the tropes that, that arise. So we've talked a lot about our hero here, but we didn't <laughs> give him a rating. Yes. So okay. um, we, we, we do do that. So out of 10, Kelsey, what would you give him? I'd give him, I'd give him a solid eight. I really liked him. Give him a solid eight. Fair. How about you, Maisie? Um... Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with like um. I'm gonna go with a seven point five. I really, I, yeah, I enjoyed him too. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm. I, I liked him. Um, I liked the story, but I feel like he's not like he's not what I go for in a hero mm. necessarily. So mm-hmm. like for me, he's a seven. Mm. But he's very good. Like, mm-hmm. 
Very good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nora was happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, I mean, he's funny. Yeah. I, and K- Tessadere is just so funny. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about Nora, though. What did you guys think about Nora? I really liked Nora in the sense that she even confronted with him. Like, she doubled down on her pamphlet because she's just like, no, like, I'm not here to, like, it's not about really you leaving. It's about women only thinking of the man they're going to marry and like maybe they just need to be them at the same time like not saying against marriage not saying against this but like you guys need to find yourselves and like don't pin all your hopes on one guy and then be crushed and don't know what to do when he's gone like be solid have a foundation and then find your guy with it and i was like look at this modern lady (laughs) in this victorian time yeah I, yeah, definitely. I would agree. I, I really enjoyed her. I thought she was really um, like a dynamic heroine because when you have like these strong like feminist heroines in um, historical romance novels, a lot of times they are like they, they're on that kind of end of the extreme where they're like really coarse and really tough and like, mm-hmm. and you know, take no prisoners. But like with Nora, like she she didn't fit that. Like she was just really dynamic in the sense that she was like – she was embarrassed at first about the fact that he might have read her pamphlet. Like she wasn't like, you know, immediately like, I don't care what he thinks. Like she did still care. She still had like really natural insecurities for a woman. Mm -hmm. But, but what made her so great was her willingness to like, you know, tell those insecurities to stuff it and that she was still going to like carry on and be this strong female and like be a, like an idol for other women, which I thought was like a really empowered take for her to have. But then She was still able to be vulnerable and, like, forgiving with her heart, too, which, um, you know, I yeah, I thought she was wonderful and super witty and dynamic and also just, like, sensitive. So I I liked her a lot. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. I mean, I think even a step further, like, I think sometimes, like you said, these, you know, women in historical romance, when they are the strong feminist one, like – Sometimes I think that the nature of the time forced them to be harder, right? Like, mm-hmm. and and kind of like have this these more like this strong personality, and so, and they reject a lot of the more feminine things. And I love that in mm-hmm. many books, but mm-hmm. I also love it when you kind of have both, which mm-hmm. you have already talked about that with Nora, with like having the natural, the normal insecurities, mm-hmm. you know, and having mm-hmm. very relatable insecurities, but also being like, no, I'm going to do this for you know other women, but even like that she still was very romantic. Mm-hmm. Like she still, she mm-hmm. knew she like didn't want to let herself love him, but she did. Mm-hmm. She still loved him, you know? And yeah. she, you know, the whole like, you know, stay with me and I running after that. him. It's <sighs> it's so like gushy and romantic. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was so very great. And, um, and so, yeah, I liked that about her. I re- I really did. I feel like we maybe got to know more about uh, Lord Dashwood than her, but just maybe a touch more. Um, mm-hmm. It's a short book, and I feel like we learned a lot about both of our characters yeah. for that. Yeah. I mean, for how short it was, like, there was so much in there. Yeah. And the fact that, like, there were big – there were passages where, like – you know, on the separate journey with like mm-hmm. the other Spindle Cove guys, like, and they weren't even in those passages, mm-hmm. you know? I, so I actually, okay, this is these thumbs fighting words that I'm going to say, but I feel like I have a stronger sense of who Nora is than I do Cassandra <laughs> from Chasing Cassandra. <laughs> oh my <laughs> Honestly, <God. laughs> that's fine because I have that, that was I my same opinion right. and you know that with <laughs> <All> me. <laughs> Maisie does not agree. Maisie does not agree. Oh, okay. Okay. I I didn't realize I was going to have to go to battle today, but (laughs) – Oh, man. I don't know. I I won't harp on this, but I really thought I knew Cassandra well. Like, I really – I adored her in, like, a different sense where she was just – it sounds bad to say, but she she was, like, a simple – yeah. She was a simple character in the sense that she, like, she just wanted to be loved. And I thought that was so beautiful. And, like, <laughs> I get it. You know, and to be fair, like, listening to that, you're right. Like, there there is an allowance for, like, a simple character. Mm-hmm. I think, however, mm-hmm. I think the reason, like, Zoe and I didn't feel the sense of knowing her is because Tom had so much going yeah, on yeah. in that book that, like, having such a simple character 
with all that, just it just made it feel very uneven between the two of them. But that being said, like I because I've read other books that I loved and I know that both like both the hero and the heroine are both simple characters. Mm -hmm. They both want like one or two things and they don't have like a crazy backstory of abandonment or like, you know, Mm -hmm. some other craziness that happened. And like they can be simple characters and they can have a beautiful, lovely story. And I love it. Mm -hmm. However, I just didn't feel the balance there versus I feel like in this book, (laughs) Nora was able to balance out like some of that dynamic with Lord Dashwood Mm -hmm. and you had a sense of who they both were Mm -hmm. in that sense because you you heard Nora's like past about like growing (sighs) up and like you know her brother died and then Lord Dashwood still continued lessons and like and you held her hand under the table we have to talk about that scene yeah because that is (laughs) one of the most brilliant scenes I've ever (laughs) read uh, ever uh, i mean it is and it's hidden in this little gem of a book yeah. but it's you don't see it coming you don't see it no. coming and it is so brilliant oh. so this is i mean I, I imagine we have not yet recorded our recap okay. and, you know parting the curtain here for the <laughs> listeners but i imagine kelsey and i are going to to uh, feature that in the recap but this is the fact oh, that yeah. like <laughs> you know, you you hear about their lessons and you kind of hear that he's left-handed. So he sits on the left. Her brother sits in the middle Ugh. and she sits on the right. And then the brother passes away and they end up sitting next to each other and they spend the whole first lesson together with their non-dominant hands clasped <sighs> under the table. And it is – Oh, my gosh. It is so it how is me. this not a movie? <laughs> I know. Just that. <gasps> just building just a movie that. around that scene. Oh, God. Are you kidding me? <gasps> me? Like, of course Nora was devastated when he left. Like, that happens and then – and like a couple years later, he leaves. Like, oh my god, that scene was so iconic. I mean, that needs to be. I want to inject that into my veins. Like, it was I'm just so like, I'm just like, I don't understand how any of that like isn't like just talked about all the time mm-hmm. because it, it, the the all, the writing is so good. Mm-hmm. The setup is mm-hmm. so. Good. And it's this tiny yeah. moment and you read it and you go like, whoa, whoa. Like, I, I, <laughs> oh God. So beautiful. I will say <sighs> though, like I love the childhood, like sweethearts trope. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, like they weren't quite sweethearts because they were a little young mm-hmm. and, but she like had a crush on him and he was a very big part of her family. So like devastated when he left. But I just love that childhood sweetheart mm-hmm. thing because you have little moments like that where you like see the connection forming when they're young. Mm-hmm. And like then like as adults, like that connection, even if they've had time apart, that connection like solidifies because like he's always going to be the boy that held her hand when her brother died. Like, Yeah. yeah. And oh, I love it. <laughs> I know. I'm like going to get choked up thinking about it because it was just so sweet. But I thought like – Using the lessons, too, was such great characterization throughout the whole novel for these characters. Because we only got, like, little tastes of it and stuff. But, like, the fact Mm -hmm. that Nora inserted herself in the lessons, like, showed how strong of a female character she was. And Mm -hmm. totally opposite of just, like, the sweet tenderness of that hand-holding was just the hilarity of, like, him admitting that he got, like... (laughs) He had boners during their lessons and like <laughs> and where yes. he's like, you had breasts. I yeah. had erections. <laughs> like I was that whole thing, like I was dying through that. It's scene. really good. It's really, really good. Uh, they're, so, they're so great. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So then uh, how about a score for Nora? What do you guys think? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It's like they were gushing, gushing, gushing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have to like hmm, pause. Because, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to give her an eight, too. Yeah. Everybody right. gets an eight. I think that's <laughs> – Yeah. I, it's a fair score. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, like, she won't go down as, like, one of the best heroines I've ever read. But, like, I really enjoyed her. She's solid. Yeah. She's solid. Yeah. yeah. I'll keep her at a seven and a half with uh, Dash. <laughs> I think I'm also going to go with the seven just because mm-hmm. the same as my rating. I feel like they're pretty even keeled mm-hmm. for, for me. And mm-hmm. so like if that's where I give him, I, I think she's right on the same level. Great characters. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, that's where I feel, um, you know, I'm a little bit of a tough, tough vote here. I know. But I did really enjoy them. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. do we have some favorite quotes that we want to share from this book? Yes. I certainly do. 
All right. How about we let Maisie go first on this one? That way we don't take her favorite quote, just in case. So that's sometimes fair. it happens. Well, okay. So I, there were, I mean, there were so many just like funny right. little one liners in here. You um, can have more than one. We'll okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to pick a romantic one and a funny one. And I kind of I, I already actually mentioned the funny one where, mm -hmm. you know, they're doing their lessons or whatever. And he's like, he's telling her she thinks like, oh, you've always respected my mind. And, you know, you would always decline to go up to the board. And he says, you, he extended both hands in her direction, vaguely cupped, had breasts. I, <laughs> he slapped his palms to his chest had erections <laughs> she blinked what oh for the love of god when a man is aroused his thankfully she cut him off i just thought that i was dying reading that because it's that was so like good. so bold like you know like the fact that he just went there with like he totally went there they're both so dramatic i love them he like just really went for it and then the other line that I loved was um, at the end when they're pulling out the atlas at like the big, you know, like mm. the big grand romantic gesture. You know, she said, then you should have turned back because he's saying like around Capricorn, I realized I missed you. And she said, you should have mm -hmm. turned back. He said it was too late for that. He kissed her lips. Luckily, the world is a sphere. I was always traveling towards you. I just took the long way around. And I... <laughs> Oh, I just thought that was so cute. It's <laughs> that was so I have cute. that one highlighted too. <laughs> <laughs> we had a similar quote about that that like it, in a book recently that that I when I read that I was like, "Oh, yes, I love that that idea." It was like sh sh it was the same thing to do with with world travel that the person had taken you know, had, had taken the, the long way. And it's just, I, I do really love that. I just, and so it, cute. Tess is so good at the phrasing, mm -hmm. you know, just these, yes. these, like the, the sentence feels like warm mm -hmm. and complete, you know, there's just something about Yummy. it. Ugh, mm -hmm. So good. Kelsey. My quote is also in the looking at the Atlas thing. And it's just before that it was too late for that. And Dash says, I named all the nothings after you because, my darling Nora, no matter where I traveled, you were always what was missing. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> I so know. Cute. Uh, well, I, I have a few. It's so hard mm -hmm. to pick. But I think I'm just going to continue on with that scene because I, I have one from that scene, too. And, and this just goes very well because Nora uh, is – he mentions that she can go with him on his, you know, map or er, his cartography expeditions. And she says, you'd take me with you. And he says, if you wish to go, and I suspect you do, if only to castigate me on other continents, there's an idea. <laughs> Come with me to Tahiti and insult me on a white sand beach. Berate me on a <laughs> South American mountaintop. So loudly, the echo sets off an avalanche. <laughs> I, just, I love that. Just I love like, it. Castigate I me on that. other continents. <laughs> it's so yes. good. So them uh, too. Like that was perfect. Oh, it really is. Oh, uh, so cute. Uh. Definitely, definitely great. So next we have our steaminess rating. And our encounter counters. So there was one whole encounter <laughs> in this one, but a good one. <laughs> um, steaminess, though, I felt like it was, it was like sweeter rather than steamy. I don't know. Yeah, I would say it's sweeter mm -hmm. rather than steamy, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Yeah, I mean, two versions. Yeah, yeah, but also two versions in like a very short book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know where you would fit another encounter <laughs> in. It takes place over a night yeah. and, like, it's very short. The back room at the bookshop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. I, I thought that they – I thought that, like, the scene – delivered you know like we had mm -hmm. a lot oh, yeah. of like sexual tension build up and i thought it was really mm -hmm. well done and i liked the fact that it wasn't over the top like yeah es you know especially for and, and just like the like pillow talk afterwards where he's like best mm -hmm. love making ever and she's like yeah i'm sure and he's like well you're the only one but I'm you know like i just <laughs> thought that was <laughs> like I, that just, it was just so well-rounded and like so like delicious and yeah, I mean, yep. I was, I was really, and I do want to, although it wasn't a full encounter, and I know, Zoe, that 
we don't want to talk about the Lords of Perdition and their side story. But <laughs> when they're like getting ready to go out and find her and like, you know, Colin has to make sure. <laughs> oh my God, I loved that. Yeah. That was hilarious. I have a great, oh, did I highlight it? There was a great, yeah. quote. maybe I did it because it was not them, but it was like, um, I, I need an hour to go I, saddle my like, horse. Yeah, it's like, okay, we'll be ready in half an hour. He's like, no, no, no. I have to take an hour, Mr. Twice this yeah. morning. I have to give my wife two orgasms. And I'm just like <laughs> cracking up with that. I love it. I just like, oh, that was good. Yeah, that very was just cute. Like, yeah. I did, you know what I think I did like about it is because like, a lot of times we talk about funny moments in books and those stick out to us because like life's funny mm-hmm. and like shit happens mm-hmm. and it's hilarious. But I liked to because like I think as much as I know you could have done without the parts of the Spindle Clove men, Zoe, I think they were the co- they were like that mm-hmm. sort of like comic relief. Mm-hmm. So that way our heroine and hero could keep having their serious moments without it feeling get mm-hmm. like get bogged down. Cause like it was short. It didn't need a whole mm-hmm. lot, but you know, these moments like kind of took you away, gave you a laugh, and then you could come back in and be like, oh, but look how sweet these yeah. guys are. I don't know. I skipped him and <laughs> it worked out fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I but I actually like, I think that's a really like logical point. And I think you're totally right. I, I, I again, just because they weren't like my favorite part mm-hmm. doesn't mean I don't like see them as good for what they are. Like they were, mm-hmm. they were, they were there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't think that like, I didn't think the book would be better without them. Mm-hmm. I just didn't need them. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Fair. So yeah. So yeah. And then having um, Nora call Dash out for being a virgin, like at the big book talk at the end. And then Colin's oh, like, yeah. I need to come to these more often. Like that was so <laughs> good too. <laughs> It was just so clever. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so that that I think I think we're in agreement there mm-hmm. with and and I don't feel like steamy makes a better book. No. I think that it no. really depends. You know, even like we I think the perfect example of a very sweet book but also that still has a really good payoff is Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Right. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. there's it's it's really not that sexy, the book, but like their no, love story not, is like, so, so beautiful. And yeah. so and so I think like any any level of heat mm-hmm. works. And, and I agree that the a level of heat that was in this book was right for mm-hmm. this book. Mm-hmm. So 100 percent. That's what makes it a success. All right. So next we have our feminist recap. Mm-hmm. So I mean, support her. <laughs> she's out there telling women they don't need a man. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, I mean, and I think like also within Tessa's writing about that. Okay, I have a quote here, and you know she she says here she just describes her pamphlet as a literary vindication for every young woman who'd pinned her hopes to a man and then watched both man and hopes walk away. So like that oh, yeah. is real. Like that is not just like you know you don't need a man. Mm-hmm. That is a you know you can hope again, right? And yeah. that is real. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's yeah. so good. <laughs> and it was like really well rounded too and how it was done because it was like, she was still like this badass feminist, like, you know, power mm-hmm. to the women, but she still like at the end allowed herself to be vulnerable and realize that like feminism and romance and learning to trust and forgiveness are all like this beautiful encompassing thing if it's with the right person, mm-hmm. which is just great. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I have these moments where it's like, you know, I mean, you have written a book, Maisie. You've mm-hmm. done it. <laughs> and, it. You know, especially now that that we're doing this podcast, it's and, and really talking about them critically rather than, mm-hmm. you know, stepping out of this the just the reader role and into the mm-hmm. and into the like, you know, reviewer slash mm-hmm. kind of critical thinker about romance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it does make me more like, oh, well, maybe maybe I want to maybe I want to try this. Yeah. But then you have moments where you read these incredible authors who are really good at their craft, obviously, mm-hmm. right? And you just go like I I I could I I yeah. couldn't. I could <laughs> do that. How like how so I'm just I'm always just so impressed by those who say, "You know what? I'm going to do it." Yeah. Which is what this character is telling mm-hmm. me to do, right? Yeah. She's telling exactly. me to do that. She's telling you to go out and do it, do Zoe. It. Go oh, out yeah. and do it. I don't, I don't, do it. I don't like have all time. things <laughs> and like all things, Zoe, practice, practice, practice. You'll never have time. <laughs> trust me. But like, 
somehow you just put a word here and a word there, and then eventually you have enough to call it a book. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and then you cry Amazing. about it a couple times, but like, <laughs> yeah, if you feel it, go for it. I like, you should do it. It's, it's well, the most rewarding I, thing. <laughs> I have a feeling it will happen eventually soon but Good. not not right now right now i have a lot of editing yeah. podcast <laughs> editing. <laughs> but um yeah so i think we're all in agreement tessa dare yeah feminist icon yes. maybe yes, <laughs> yes absolutely 100%. yeah she's fantastic and then she writes really really great characters that are so empowering so we're on to our last segment Somehow, sadly, although we've talked for a long time, so that's great, um, which is just our final book rating. So what would you guys give this lovely little novella? I'm going to give it a 9.5 because it was awesome and lovely and I loved every oh. moment of it and like it could have been like I just I just wanted it to keep going. <laughs> wow. Like, <laughs> All right. What about you, Maisie? Um. Well, you know, I, I review in eggplants, so <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I I would give it so I usually do it out of five stars. Um I would give it a four point two five because it was like yeah, I, I mean I thought it was wonderful. I loved it. There I mean, I will give you the fact that there were some parts with the Lords of Perdition that were like draggy a little bit. So that was the only mm-hmm. thing where I was like, I almost wanted a little more of Dash and Nora, but like it still added so much and I just thought it was wonderful and it was just so fuzzy. Like it was exactly what I needed to read. And I don't think I could give a virgin hero less than you know, a four <laughs> ever. Well, and, and if we just multiply that by two, we get to 8.5. There it so is. There, it is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. For me, I, I'm i waffling a little bit. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is a very good novella. Mm-hmm. We, we've reviewed one other novella on the show, which is The Governess Affair by Courtney Milan. Mm-hmm. And to me, that is a 1,000 out of 1,000. I think that book yes. is like such a perfect novella. I don't know if anybody else can ever write a novella that is that perfect uh, for, for me, but this one's really good. Mm-hmm. And what I like about this one is it's much shorter than The Governess mm-hmm. Affair. So it's very different, right? Like it's because yes. because The Governess Affair is is a little bit long, but it's not that – it's still a novella. Mm-hmm. It's still very a mm-hmm. novella. But – um. Yeah, so I feel like this one's going to get an eight from me. I feel like this is a really good – this is a really good Mm -hmm. novella. Like, And and I love the story. It's fun. I love that I can just kind of like skim read it Mm -hmm. too and like have my little happily ever after if I just need something. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I like to do that. I like to like open something up, know that I can finish it, Mm -hmm. and know that like I'm just going to have my little happily ever after right there. Yeah, and I think that for me why it rates so high is it's just like – you know, this is the perfect book to pick up when you've just mm-hmm. had like a bad day and you just want to read something before you go to bed. You can literally pick this up and finish it. Mm-hmm. And by the end of it, you're just like warm, it's fuzzy so feelings. Fuzzy. It's fine. The and end, now I can sleep that peacefully. That ending scene is – there's so much payoff oh, in yeah. that final scene. Yeah. Like all of the lines that we pulled from it and just like all of the moments and the kind of – when you do have those uh, secondary characters, you know, piping in their mm-hmm, little yeah. lines, especially if you – especially if you do know the series and you love the series, yeah. I think, yeah, the, the payoff is great there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great book. <laughs> I mean, it was a good I was I was a little worried. I feel like, you know, I was a little worried about starting with this as our first Tessa Dare book because mm-hmm. it's Tessa Dare and like she's written so many great books that I would love to talk about. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I actually am like really, really happy because this is like the perfect Yeah you know, like bite little bite-sized thing. Mm-hmm. And she's so good at oh. that. I, I actually feel similarly to her Christmas novella that came out in paperback this year. I don't remember the name of it. It's the it's in that anthology mm-hmm. um, of novellas. Oh, yeah, and I read it. Yeah, I read it too. We both read it for book clubs. Yeah. And yeah, it's, she does a really good job with this kind of whirlwind novella mm-hmm. romance. Like, she does. Oh, so good. There was another one too. She's, I mean, she's written like quite a few novellas too. And she just does such a good job of making them like full stories and just like beautiful arcs. And like they feel just right. Like it never feels like she rushed anything or it was just too surface level. Like it, it feels like a full story, but like 
kind of almost with like the productivity of you know just like a couple of hours spent reading it and yeah she she's mm-hmm. just a queen i can't i can't even deal with her she makes me want to light my laptop on fire and like never <laughs> like i just love her <laughs> She's she's great. And it's funny because we've talked to a couple of authors and like, you know, Maya Rodale, one thing she said when we asked her about what her favorite romance book was, Mm -hmm. was, you know, she couldn't pick. But right now she was going through a a phase where she wanted something that was going to make her happy. Mm -hmm. And so she chose Tessa Dare Mm -hmm. because Tessa Dare books Mm -hmm. are always just going to make you happy. And yes. th- that is an incredible gift mm-hmm. as a writer. And yeah. so, like, thanks, Tessa. Yeah. Thank you, Tessa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to, like, go on a Tessa Dare binge. I just yeah. got it. I'm going to, like, reread all of Spindle Cove, reread all the other <laughs> yeah. ones. I, I, and you're not a rereader. So that's, <laughs> I know I'm not a rereader, but, like, God, reading this book, I was like, I need to reread <laughs> Spindle Cove. I, I know. Need this in my I life know. right I now. I love that series so much. And, like, maybe, maybe I should give it another try. You should, I don't know. You should. <laughs> I think what maybe happened was like I read it when I was coming out of horses mm. and especially Beauty and the Blacksmith. I just remember being like, this is weird because <laughs> like I'm no longer working with horses and now there's this blacksmith story and I used to be really close to our blacksmith, oh. like our farrier. Oh. And so I think maybe there was just like mm-hmm. some personal feelings mm-hmm. going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I was I was like talking to you. I mean – to me, like my two favorite historical romance authors are Lisa Kleypas and Tessa Dare. Mm-hmm. And like yeah. reading Tessa Dare is like, I don't know, it's like eating sorbet on like a summer day. Like it's just makes mm-hmm. you feel so good and she's so like tangy and fun. And then like Lisa's yeah. like dark chocolate cake or like a warm brownie. <laughs> yeah. No, and I feel the same way. And I definitely go through phases and it's the same thing, like you know, my husband, I'll be looking at movies and he'll be like, let's watch this drama. And I'm like, can we just watch a rom-com? <laughs> like, I need to watch a rom-com. I want light. Mm-hmm. I want fluffy. If it's a musical, Even like, better. God bless, <laughs> you know, like, I just like, I was like, I'm just like, I can't deal with like drama mm-hmm. and like me. Like, I just, I need yeah. happy in my oh. life. And so like, same, like, I'm a, like, you know, I've read everything by Tessa mm-hmm. Dare. I've read everything by like Julia Quinn, uh-huh. you yeah. know, like. Yeah, happy on this, and then like some of the more ones where like I want those intense, intense stories, like Lisa Claypool, like they can be intense stories, and like I love all the writing, like Kerrigan Byrne. You know, I I read a book by her, and I was like, oh my god, this is fabulous! Like this is so amazing, but. I couldn't pick it up just on every yeah, day. No. Like I need to like I yeah. need to have like time yeah. to read it and digest every it. Group. I need to go in <laughs> with like a certain yeah. mindset and like yeah. Versus like a Tessa Dare, I'm like I feel sad. Tessa Dare, yeah. oh look, I'm happy again. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's not the the great thing that I that the great balance that she does is. It's not all fluff, mm-hmm. right? Like it's not. Yeah, no, it's there substance. Is, with there the is fluff. so much in there, and but it is very uplifting. So, I realized one of the things that we didn't do, um, which we said we were going to do with you, was ask you about your favorite book. And I don't know if you prepared for this. So, it did is that something you are willing to talk about? <laughs> I did. I I have thought about this nonstop for about two weeks now. I like I know I, I lost sleep over. No, I'm just kidding. But like, okay, so <laughs> I came up with three answers because that's just how it is. Um, so I know this is Regency romance, but I will throw my favorite contemporary out there. It's Sweet Filthy Boy by Christina Lauren. It's wonderful. Great title. I really love it. <laughs> but for historical, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um. For historical, I decided to break it down between an alpha hero and a beta hero and just divide it up that way. And so my favorite alpha hero romance is Devil in Winter Ugh, by Lisa Clayton. Such a good book. And, <laughs> you know, Fabulous. And, like I could squeal for hours about that book. Like I, I listened to you guys on Galentine's Day talk about it and like talk about Evie. And I just like it is so good. It's hilarious. It's delicious. Yes. It's spicy. And like, I mean, Sebastian is just to die for. He's so <laughs> cocksure. He's Ugh. such like he's such a dick sometimes. Yeah. But like I just love, love him. Huh? him. <laughs> It's hard and not then, to love him. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, Evie is just like... She's, mm-hmm. she's she fabulous. Really is. 
she's a boss ass bitch. I love her. She's like, you know, she's like a quiet alpha in her own mm-hmm. right. And I like, and I love her even more. All the little glimpses that we get of her in the, in, you know, the R- Ravenel mm-hmm. series and everything. Um, I just, oh my God, I love that book so much. And then this one is kind of controversial because like I've, I've literally gotten into fights with people on bookstagram mm-hmm. about if this person is a beta hero or not, but to me, A Week to Be Wicked is my favorite beta hero book. And a lot of people don't think Colin is a beta hero, but I do, 100%. But I think A Week to Be Wicked might be one of the funniest Tessa Dare novels that she ever wrote. And might might just be one of the funniest historical romances I've ever read. Like, those two kill me. And just, like, just the absolute shit show of them getting to Gretna Green oh and, like... <laughs> And, and just, like, Colin being ridiculous and Minerva just being, like, so damn curious. I, and like, I, I love them. And I, I – yeah, so that, that has to be my other favorite. And I, I could reread those books over and over again and not get sick of them. And I think a big part of that is just how well, like, the banter and the relationship buildup is between all of those characters. Thank you for solidifying my choice to reread Spindle Cove. <laughs> yes, do it. Oh, that's fabulous. It's so good. It's yeah. funny. I – yeah, I really – I know I've read them all. I have them all on my nook. Like, I've definitely read them, but I don't really remember them. So, I mean, perhaps really – it really is time for me to give them all another shot. If that's yes. your favorite, yeah. I, I mean, mean, like, it's – I yeah. know it's good. It's it just is. like – there's just plenty of fabulous Sebastians. I mean, like, really, let's talk about the yeah. fabulous Collins. Like, oh, yeah. Collins – I know. I know. Like, <laughs> if you have a hero named Colin, it's like, you better be fabulous because, like, everyone yep. else is fabulous with that name. And yep. same thing with – Sebastian. It's just like oh, the Sebastians I and know. the Collins. Yeah, <gasps> we've got Colin Eversey, oh Colin Bridgerton, the Colin Sandhurst. Yeah. Is that his last <gasps> name here in this one? Yeah. So yeah, there's some yep. Yeah, it's it's funny because yeah, one day we'll do an episode like all on Sebastians and Collins. Maybe we'll just have oh a, yeah, we'll oh just my have god, a, a Sebastian <laughs> showdown. <laughs> yes, you, you can do it for like yeah. March Madness bracket but style. Madness. Yeah, <laughs> because there's so many good ones. There's it's oh yeah, such a good uh, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, they kill yeah. me. Yeah, but no, Zoe, I like, I will, I need you to reread A Week to Be Wicked. And I just okay. need you to love it too. <laughs> Sorry, I just do. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I have my assignment. I will work on it and I will report back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I first on my reading list is next week's book, which I have to read. So, <laughs> so I will I will do that first. But then after that, hopefully we'll okay. have some space. All right, all right. There's always space for another Tessa Dare. I mean, there just there's is. always space. Yeah. Really, always. Yeah, they're so quick they too. Are. You know, mm-hmm. you can plow through them. Well. Thank you so much, Maisie, for joining us. This yes, has been thank you so much for joining us. This has been so 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 much fun. We've talked for way too long. <laughs> We just did that like 10 million recordings because technology was not in our favor. <laughs> no. No, this has been such a blast. Thank you for having me. I love you guys. Aww. I love your show. I just you. you're do you're doing the good work Aww, out thank here. You. We're having so much fun doing it. And we'll have to do this again sometime. Yes. Oh my God. Wasn't that just so fun? It was like being on Book Club, except we were talking through the internet. Oh, it was so fun. And it's so fun. I mean, our our listeners only get to hear our voices and I'm sure that they can feel the excitement through the airwaves. But like seeing both of you guys too and like our faces and different things where we were just like, ah, or ah, or whatever <laughs> it was, you know, it was so fun. No. And it, it was so fun because even in like the middle of our technical difficulties, like Oh, and let me tell you, listeners, I <laughs> I feel very – pat myself on the back for all that editing to the, there because I have actually already edited our our discussion segment before we recorded this, and uh, it was so many different tracks. It was just nuts. I, we had a power outage. We had all sorts of issues with like just our recording service, and uh, I think it turned out well, so I hope you all think so too. <laughs> yes. No, but it was so much fun and chatting with Maisie. Like, I could have just chatted with her for days. 
<laughs> yes, she was great. She's got such a great energy. And actually, we were such little dunces because we forgot to give her the opportunity to tell people where to find her. So I'm going to do that for you all now because you really should check all of her stuff out. She is just as funny on the internet, in writing, and in all of her facets that you can find her. She's just the same. She's she's fantastic. So yes, thank you so much, Maisie, for joining us. We're sorry we were such terrible hosts and forgot to ask you to promote your stuff, but You should definitely follow Maisie on Instagram. She's at romance.in.the.wild, at romance in the wild with periods in between. And she's just so funny and so great and so real. And I really just recommend you check her out. She's going to be a bright spot in your day. You should also check out her fabulous articles on Frolic. And we will link to those in our show notes so that you can go straight to all the articles written by her. And if you want even more Maisie content, you should head on over to her blog, which is romanceinthewild.home.blog. And I will also link to that in the show notes. So you guys should definitely check all of her stuff out if you're not already doing so. Yes. And we didn't talk about it in the parlor, But I just wanted to say a special shout out thank you to everyone who has thus far left us a review this month. We are so honored. They are so great. We can't wait to send out your bookmarks. It's just, um, it's really humbling to see what you guys think. And it really means a lot to us that you take the time out of your day to do that. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. So Kelsey, what are we reading next time? So next time, we are going to be reading My Beautiful Enemy by Sherry Thomas. Ooh. Yes. So this one is a very exciting. There's spies involved. This is also our first cross-cultural romance. So because one of our main characters was born and raised in China. So, mm-hmm. But we do get some Victorian England in there. So it's just very, very exciting. And I'm excited to share it with you all. Yes, I I recently finished this book and I'm so excited to get to talk about it. It was quite an adventure. So I am really excited for this episode and we can't wait, like Kelsey said, to share it with all of you guys. So thank you so much for listening. Join us next time as we read My Beautiful Enemy by Sherry Thomas. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Um, are you guys still there? Frozen. You're yeah. frozen, Zoe. Yeah. I see that. Just so wait I lost internet. Okay. <laughs> Usually it does anyway. Okay. Hello, it back guys. Can you hear we'll me? Tell her to take it again. Uh, it just Doesn't came like back on. Co. I know. Hello? It's just... It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. We've that's had crazy. differing uh, um, we actually like it when we have differing opinions yeah. on books. And like we had one, our last one. Uh not the last one, but the one before that we did. Uh-oh, Zoe loved session. it. And then I was just like, oh, no, nope, wasn't for me. No internet. Really. Oh, She's no. like, How did you not love it? And I was like, I really didn't. <laughs> was it offer for a gentleman? Uh no, you guys both like that one, right? Yeah, no, it was the um Scarlet Peckham one. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, uh, I and I just, I get why she likes it, and there were parts I wanted to like. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, Zoe's power went out. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, man. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is going to make it in, listeners, but unfortunately, Zoe's power went out, so we have lost Zoe. Oh, I, Zoe. I know. <laughs> oh, sorry, babe. Well, you know, a day of misadventures. Isn't this a common trope in romance novels, right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're living our own, our own friendship romance novel right now. Oh, okay. Zoe's setting up a hotspot so she can rejoin. Oh, okay. So, excellent. Good. Oh. Okay, cool. Oh, yay, there she is. Hi. <laughs> Mercury's in retrograde. Oh. I turned a good friend of mine on to, like, the export notes from your Kindle tool. 
And I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, you can export like from your Kindle, you can export your notes and it'll send it to you in a beautiful PDF and what? it'll show you all your highlights with your notes. And it's my favorite thing ever because I can get it all in one like PDF instead of having to scroll through my Kindle. Yeah. <gasps> so now you know. Oh my god. So if you gosh. go to notes on your Kindle and then down at the bottom, it'll tell you to export it and it'll just export it to your email. And it's a beautiful yeah, PDF a version of it. That is insane. Oh my God. It's been there that whole time too. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> wow. The more you guys are teaching me so much. <sighs> you learn new things. So I'm I'm back on my normal internet. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Excellent. It's still like thundering. We may lose power again. This is weird for San Diego. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I've never had to deal with this before. I'm just like, what the fuck? Okay. Um, <laughs> anyhow. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, smiting for not liking uh, yeah. Spindle Cove, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. And it's not like I dislike Spindle Cove. It's just like, okay. So uh, where did you guys get to when you lost me? Did you guys keep going? No, we kind or? of talked about um, how w- life, life and uh, how we really enjoy uh, disagreeing on books. It's quite fun for us, actually. Oh. <laughs> when you and I disagree on a book, we actually rather enjoy it. <laughs> it is. It's actually really interesting, although I'm still really upset about the early <laughs> Yeah. I know. I was telling her about that. I was like, so I was like, how do you not like this? And I was like, mm, no, nope, so mm, nope. <laughs> I'm so upset. <laughs> Um, okay, Perfect. so uh, I'm going to try to pick up back what I was saying, which mm-hmm. was my general thoughts about the book, and then I'll edit it all in, and we'll have a lot of great bloopers <laughs> for the end. <laughs> um, okay, so 